Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, I tell you what, if you're not having a good time, it's your own fault. <laughs> I mean, we have been rocking and rolling since we pulled in at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. And um, I, I got to tell you, if, if you see me get a little bit clamped this morning, first of all, know that we're okay with it. We got our tissue. We're good to go. Um, but it's because this is the kind of AA that I grew up with. You know, when I walked into these rooms, this this is what I heard. And I, I am full of it this weekend, and I'm overwhelmed, and I'm loving being with all of you. Um, my name is Amanda, and I'm an alcoholic. Amen. And by the grace of God, I'm sober today. My sobriety date is May 19th, 1991. Uh, my home group will always be the Level Plains group, the Wildgrass Club right outside of Enterprise. That's where I got sober. Um, my home group today is the Happy Hour group in Montgomery, Alabama. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. We like that so much, it's painted on our wall. <laughs> we have a meeting every morning at 6.30 and at noon and at 6. You won't see me at the 6.30. I didn't drink early and I don't get up early, but you'll catch me. You'll catch me at the noon or the 6 on any given Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. I want to um, thank the committee so much, so much for giving Mom and I this opportunity to come and share our story. It is always an honor and a privilege to get asked to speak. And I don't know if, you know, if you've never spoke, then you never have understood the feeling and the blessings that as a speaker that I get out of getting to come and hear the other speakers and fellowshipping with all of you. Blonde was reading a magazine one day and she was reading about taking a milk bath. She said, you know, that sounds like it might be pretty good. It read about being good for your skin, and she thought she might want to take a milk bath. So she called up her milkman, and she said, I need 40 gallons of milk. He said, okay, I wrote down, you know, he wrote down four gallons of milk. She said, no, no, you misunderstood me. I said 40 gallons of milk. I read about taking a milk bath, and I want to take one. He said, well, all right, you want whole or you want 2%? She thought about it for a minute. She said, well, I think I'll take the whole. It's got more cream in it, and that's probably better for your skin. He said, okay, what about pasteurized? No, just about chest level, so I can splash around a little bit. I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon, and my name is Angie. Hi. My home group is the Level Plains Al-Anon Family Group in Level Plains, Alabama. Uh, and I'd, I would like to echo what Amanda said. Thank you so much for asking us to come and speak. Uh, as a mother and a daughter that, that have other lives, uh, it's not often that the two of us get to get together and just spend time together, the two of us. So, so thank you for allowing us to have that opportunity. Uh, when I, when I look back on my, on my family, I have to say that, that my family was built on secrets. And I have spent a lot of my adult life trying to learn about those secrets in my family. And I'm not big on secrets today. I'm pretty open. What you see is what you get. That's the way I like to treat people. That's the way I like for people to treat me. Because that's not what I had in my family. Uh, one of my father's secrets was he was in the military and he was in the artillery. And he worked with Honest John missiles. And Honest John missiles were some of the very first missiles there were that had nuclear warheads on them. So his work was very secret. Very secret. Now, I knew he was in the military. I knew we would go and see the... Uh, the troops pass in review, and they would salute him and do those kind of things. And we all dressed up and went to the forest on occasion and watched rock rockets shoot off. And I never thought anything about that. You know, we would all have our Sunday clothes on, and they'd have all these folding chairs out in the middle of the woods. And we would sit there and wa watch them shoot off rockets. And we'd all clap when they shot them off and that kind of thing. You know, when I look back on that today, I, I realized that my crazy thinking started at a very early age because that was normal to me. We had what was called bug-out bags, and the bug-out bag stayed in the closet right beside the front door. I thought everybody had a bug-out bag, and it was only when I became an adult that I really knew they didn't. And in, that, in my bug-out bag was some books and some clothes, some changes of clothes, and um, some toys to play with. And, and as I grew up, the toys would get a little bit bigger. And I always knew if my mom or my dad said it's time to bug out, that I wasn't to ask any questions. I was just to go to that closet and get my bug-out bag, and we were going to leave. And um, in my later years, I learned that uh, because of the job that my father had in the military, sometimes other countries wanted to kidnap his family. And so we had to be ready to always leave at a moment's notice, no questions asked. 
Uh, so, so that was the environment I grew up with in my home for my dad. One of my mother's secrets was that she was an alcoholic. And I was in my 20s before I ever saw her make a drink. And I can still remember distinctly the day that I saw her stand at the sink and, and kind of bend down and get the liquor out of the cabinet, and she had the jigger there, and she made her drink. She always drank out of, most of my life, a brown plastic glass that sat on the table. And I would always see her with that glass, and I always knew she had it. But, you know, al we have a great denial system. Now, please understand, I had been seeing my mother make drinks since I was a little bitty child, but I never saw her make a drink until that day in my 20s, okay? One of my brother's secrets was he was dyslexic. He could read, but the words were all jumbled up. I didn't know this until about three years ago with my brother. Uh, my brother's a college graduate. He works at a hospital. He's, in a, he's uh, on the administrative staff of a hospital. Uh, he's a great, has a great scientific mind, went through college, and nobody in my family ever knew that the words were jumbled up when he read them. So that's one of my brother's secrets that, that was going on in my family when I was growing up. Uh, I'm still learning today about what some of my secrets were, because you see, I don't remember a lot about my childhood. When I was doing my four-step inventory, it was very difficult for me because there was so much and that I don't remember which is, I guess, one reason I've gone on this quest to try to find out about the secrets. But I am learning more and more. And I do know in my family, I lived most of my life escaped. I loved books. I loved reading. And I would just go to wherever that book took me, whether it was in the middle of the day, whether it was in the middle of the night, no matter what was going on, that was my escape. So much of my life I lived in other places with other people doing other things. As I grew up in that family, of course, you know, I'm, I grew up and I learned and I lived. And, of course, at some point in life, men entered my life. Uh, and I am one of those people that uh, there can be 500 folks in a room and the spotlight will shine on the one alcoholic. So you can imagine right now, there's spotlights just everywhere in here for me. <laughs> I love to come to roundups. I love being around people that are alcoholics in recovery today uh, because I learned a long time ago that, that I was always going to love alcoholics and I needed to stick with the winners, and I've tried to do that to the best of my ability. But the light would shine on that person. I'll tell you a little bit about that person. That person always had a great personality. His eyes sparkled. His teeth gleamed. He laughed. He joked. He was the life of the party. Everybody liked him. Everybody had a good time with him. He knew how to dance. He could just dance up a storm. He could tell great jokes. You loved being around him. He knew how to treat you like a lady. He also knew how to treat you not like a lady. He uh, knew how to be abusive, either verbally or physically or mentally or emotionally. He himself was either abused verbally, physically, mentally, or emotionally growing up. He didn't have a clue how to handle anger. He knew how to punch with his fist. He knew how to scream, but that was about all he knew about how to deal with anger. He didn't know much about other emotions at all because he was usually cut off from them. Uh, he didn't know much at all about how to have a successful relationship. And it was only a couple of years ago that I realized why the spotlight would shine on that person for me. And you see, it's because he was me. He was me. I believe we are much more similar than we are different. I didn't have a clue how to handle anger. I knew how to blast it out at you. That's all I knew. I didn't. I was completely cut off from all the other emotions that I had. Uh, I had had abuse in my history. I knew how to be verbally abusive with others. I guess really the only difference in he and I was that he drank. Okay? Uh, he drank. I went from relationship to relationship, went through about a 15-year period that I was either meeting a man, dating a man, marrying a man, or divorcing a man. Uh, that was that 15-year period of my life. Uh, and I have to say, the, the one good thing, the, the best thing that came out of that 15 years was when I was married to my first husband and we had a daughter named Amanda. I, um, I can remember feeling different. How many alcoholic stories start that way? I can remember feeling different. And I always want to encourage newcomers, you know, when you go to hear speaker meetings or whatever, try to listen for the similarities. I know for me, for a long time, I listened to the, well, my detail wasn't that, my detail wasn't that, I didn't do that. But when I started listening to the similarities, our details may be a little bit different, but I believe it's the same underlying thing. 
I had a hole in me that I couldn't fill up. And for me in the beginning, that hole was I didn't have a daddy. You see, when Mama, the way I understand it, when Mama was about six months pregnant with me, um, Slim was beating on her and uh, got the shotgun out, and she called up her daddy, my Peepaw, and said, come get me. And so Peepaw went and got her, and she moved to Andalusia. Andalusia is my hometown. It's a little bitty town, uh, South Alabama. Um, everybody knows my grandparents. Everybody knows both sets of my great-grandparents. Everybody knows me. We all went to the VFW, the American Legion. Peepaw was president of the Chamber of the Commerce. Me, Mama, ran a Goodwill. Everybody knew me. Everybody knew my mama. She wrote for the newspaper. Everybody knew me. Okay, everybody I knew looked alike, acted alike, talked the same. Um, and, and so that was in our little town. You know, mama talks about that she didn't see me ma pour a drink, uh, until she was in her twenties. I called it the me dance. Um, you know, because everybody knew us and we had a big family, there was always parties in our house. And, um, me ma would start doing her little dance. And it went like that. And I figured out that she was mixing the toddies. See, all the liquor was underneath the kitchen cabinet. So she'd get down there and get a bottle and stand up and pour it in them plastic cups and get another bottle over. And she was mixing toddies for everybody. And whenever the dance was occurring, you know, it was laughing and a good time and everybody was having a good time. Um, but back to feeling different, you know, the first time I felt different, I can remember being on the playground in kindergarten and people asking me, you know, well, what does your daddy do? Well, I don't have a daddy. So that set me apart. My favorite relatives were either drunks or alcoholics. There ain't a twig on my family tree that don't have a drunk, an alcoholic, a gambler, something on it. My family tree is full of it, all the way back as far as we can go. Um, so, you know, we've got, you know, we lived out in the country, five miles from town. We have our own pond. People would go fishing every weekend. We'd have fish fries. I'm so excited about today. At one o'clock, I will be there with bells on. Um, but, you know, it was always laughter and telling jokes. My favorite aunt and my favorite uncle, Aunt Mutt and Uncle MC, told the best stories. I loved it. They had the big red nose and the big red cheeks, and I loved them. That's who I went to. Um, when I was about eight years old, Mama made a decision that she needed to go back to college and, and uh, finish her degree and better herself. Well, that's fine. Um, by now, she'd been married and divorced a couple of times. Uh, and I had, she came to me and asked me a question about did I want to stay with me, Mom and Peepaw in Andalusia with all my family and both sets of great grandparents and grandparents and, and all my cousins or did I want to move to Birmingham with her? And I can tell you that was a hard decision for me to make because on the one hand I had everything that I knew, you know, whether it was dancing or playing in the band or singing in the church choir or going off with Mama. And if you went off with Mama, I didn't really know what I would get. You know, sometimes we would stay with a guy and we live in a shack with the 70s orange shag rug. Or he might be in an apartment. You know, I never knew what I was going to get. So I had a lot of fear there. And I chose to stay with me, Mom and Peepaw. And Mama leaves for four years. Um, that became uh, an important part in my life. That, that started a journey for me. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead to my 12th year because a lot of stuff happened when I was 12. I heard a speaker tell one time if we could keep everybody out of Southern Baptist churches and not let them turn 12, they'd be a lot less alcoholics. <laughs> so, so here it goes. <laughs> um, you know, me, Mom, and Peepaw, uh, being raised with them, they, they were my safe place. Whether Mama was married or divorced, I could always come back home to me, Mom, and Peepaw's place. That was my safe place. That's the, the place I knew. Peepaw had his spot at the table. Meemaw had her spot. I had my spot. Uh, and, and life rocked on. I was in dance. Um, I was in music. I played alto saxophone in the band. I was singing in the choir. Anything I could do, I did. And today I understand that's because I was trying to run from everything that was going on with me and everything that was going on in that household. I was a typical overachiever. Anything I could do outside of the home, I was going to do. Um, sometimes Mama shares that, you know, she never heard me, Mom, and Peepaw uh, fuss at each other. Well, that wasn't my experience. I can remember getting up in the middle of the night and wanting some water, and me, Mom, and Peepaw would be standing there at their bedroom doorway in their underwear just going at it, just fussing. You know, Peepaw's there in his white tank and his boxers, and me, Mom's there in her girdle, and they just tying one on, you know, right there. Um, and that made me nervous. You know, that caused a lot of fear in me. I didn't like that. Um, so a couple of things started happening. The first thing that happened was um, Mama had always told me that when I was 12 years old, um, then I could go and find my real daddy. Well, who doesn't want to find the other half of them? See, I've already told you about that hole inside of me, and I'm wanting to fill that up. So maybe if I go find my real daddy, 
Maybe that'll help fill that hole up. I had one picture of my daddy. It was a picture of them on their wedding day. He's about six foot six, tall, slender. They called him Slim. Uh, clean haircut, one blue eye, one green eye. Handsome man. I can see why she picked him. So um, that's the picture I had of him. I told Mama, yes, you know, let's let's go find him. So she called up his mama's house, and he was still living there. That should have been the first clue. <laughs> So me and Mama and my favorite aunt, Aunt Mutt, the one that tells such good stories, uh, take off to Spring Hill, Tennessee. Now there's a Saturn plant there. It used to be just a whole lot of countries and hills and all that. So we take off up there and, and get to the house. And it's probably around lunchtime. And um, Grandma answers the door in her best nightgown. That should have been the second clue. Um, you know, and, and we hug and say hello to Grandma. And then my Grandpa... Uh, comes around, and he's six foot six, big, wide as a door frame man, NRA president, KKK card carrying, hillbilly from Tennessee. And I say that with all the love, but I mean, that's, that was Grandpa. So, hug Grandpa. So we sit down, and uh, now remind you, I'm from a little town. Everybody looks like me. Everybody talks like me. I know how to act. I know how to use the fork at the dinner tables. I was taught that children to be seen, not to heard. Everything that you hear about a southern family, okay? And I hear this noise. And I don't know what this noise is. Well, today I know it was a motorcycle, and it was coming up the driveway. And the best way for me to describe it is, you know, as I'm hearing this noise I've never heard before, is there's a woolly booger sitting on the heart, on the motorcycle. So this woolly booger gets up, and it comes to the door, and it's got a beard down to here, and it's got hair down to here, and it's covered in tattoos. And this one says the F word. I had never even heard it, let alone seen it. Um... <laughs> And it walks in the door and it says, well, aren't you going to hug your old man? Well, no, you know. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. That was my daddy. That was the other half of me that I'd been looking for all this time. Second thing that happened that year was um, uh, Mima and I had gotten our signals crossed one day from school, and um, I was at the back of the school, and she was at the front of the school, and for two and a half hours, neither one of us knew where the other one was. And I knew that when she finally found me, it was going to be on. on. You see, this was back before the days of DHR and child abuse and all that kind of stuff, and so if we got in trouble in Mima's house, you had to go out and pick a switch off the rose bush, and if it didn't have enough... <laughs> She'd go out and get one for you. Yeah, them days. And so uh, when she found me, sure enough, you know, we get home, and uh, she whips me with that rose switch until I got blood running down my legs. And I learned that day to tell a lie. I called my mama, and she came home from Birmingham, and she told me, Mom, she said, you will never lay another hand on my child like you've done today. But what that did for me was I had to learn real quick to see why, hey, see, I wasn't ever going to go through that again. I didn't care if I had to lie, beg, bar, or steal. I wasn't ever going to go through that again. And I began to lie. Lied if I had to. Lied if I didn't have to. I never got another beating. I wasn't planning on getting another beating. I was surviving in the environment that I was in. Third thing that happened that year, me and people are out there fishing, as we love to do on any weekend, and um, we're out there talking, and somehow we got on the fact about him and me my arguing a lot, you know, and, and that they argued and weren't really happy and... Um, so we're talking, and I made the comment, I was like, well, Peepaw, why don't you just divorce me? My mama does it all the time. <laughs> no big deal. I come home one day, and, and Peepaw's sitting at his spot, and Meemaw's sitting at her spot, and uh, he pulls me over to his lap, says, come here, i got something I want to tell you. And he says, uh, do you remember that day we were fishing, and we were talking about me and Meemaw arguing? I said, well, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, do you remember what you said? And I said, yes, sir. I said, why didn't y'all get a divorce? And he said, well, we are. So you see, in my little 12-year-old mind, it was all my fault. The weight of the world was on my shoulders. It was my fault that me, Mom, and Peepaw were going to get a divorce. If I hadn't have said it out loud, it wouldn't have happened. All these things are going through my little mind. All of it, you know, um, lying, not, you know, being a different child than I was raising to be. Um, my daddy not being what I thought he was going to be, that other half of me. And now my world, my safe place is gone. My safe place is gone. On that day in Tennessee when uh, we went to see Amanda's father, and I will say that he has given us permission to, uh, to share some of his story as we share our story. And he walked in that room that day. I was the one who stood up and went over and hugged his neck. 
And I will tell you that that trip for me was, was a very freeing experience because we had had a very abusive relationship. And I was able to see on that trip that I was a person of worth and I was a person of value and that I could have courage, that I could have courage to stand up to that. Uh, it was a very freeing day for me, but it was also a very shocking experience for me as well because I, too, knew the person that I had been married to, and then I had seen the result of uh, years passing and what had happened. Some 34 years ago, I was living in Andalusia, Alabama, and I was in a play, and the name of the play was Carousel. And, of course, there was a person that was in the play that the spotlight shone on for me, and his name was Paul. Paul played the villain, and I played the lady of the evening in the play, so of course it made sense that we would get together. (laughs) On our first date, we went and saw Superman with Christopher Reeve. And for our second date, Paul said, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I go to AA. Would you like to go to a meeting with me? And of course, I said, sure. Now, I will tell you that I'm a recovering alcoholic, kind of just went in one ear and out the other, you know. I didn't know what that was, never heard of it, you know. So I asked my mother if she could babysit a man, and she said, sure. And I said, I'm going on a date. She said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to an AA meeting. And she said, what is AA? And I said, well, I don't know, but AAA is all about cars, so I'm thinking it's something about cars. <laughs> she said, well, what kind of meeting would they have about cars? I said, I don't know, but I'm going. Okay? So he picks me up, and, and we take off, and we go to a town outside of Andalusia called Red Level, Alabama, and we go to a place called First Step which I didn't know it at the time, but I know today was an alcohol treatment center. And he says, you go over there and get on that bus, and I'm going to go in for a little bit, and then I'll come back out, and we'll go, we'll go to the AA meeting. So I said, okay. So I thought, man, this is cool. I'm going to get to ride a bus. So I go sit on the bus, you know, and I'm sitting there. And in a few minutes, people start coming out. They're all men. And they don't look in real good shape. And they start getting on this bus with me. And I'm sitting there thinking, I mean, one comes out, five come out. Ten come out, twelve come out, and they're all getting on this bus with me. And I'm sitting there thinking, Angie, honey, you have done it again. (laughs) You're with a man you don't know very well. You're going where you don't know. You're with people you don't know, and you don't know what's going to happen when you get there. Honey, you have done it again. And so we take off. We go to Op, Alabama. And I cannot tell you the relief that that just filled my soul when we pulled into a church parking lot. Oh, gosh. I was so glad. We all troop off that bus, and, and we get, you know, we go in the church, and Paul says, now we're going over here, and you go over there. And I said, okay. So I go over there, and there's a lady standing at the door. Her name was Miss Ina. And I can tell you that I can see her as good today as I saw her 34 years ago. I can see her as clear as I see you. And she took me by the hand, and we went in that room, and we had a, we, it was an Al-Anon meeting. She gave me this book that I, that I still have today. Uh, and I can't tell you much of what was said at that meeting, but I can tell you two things. One was, I knew I was loved. I knew that I was loved. And for me, that's about the first time in my life that I knew I was loved. And the second thing was, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. I knew I was home. I knew I was home. But you see, for me, the the thing was, I didn't feel like I was supposed to be there because I didn't know anybody that had a problem with alcohol. Now, understand, every branch on my tree has got it. But you see, that was life for me. That was life. That's, that's, it was just life. I stayed now on a while, then I left, then I stayed, then I came back. You know, I graduated a number of times. I would learn enough just to be dangerous, and I'd run out there and, and live life, and then I'd get myself in such a terrible fix and mess that I'd run back to Al Anon again. But I will tell you, any time I went, you were always there. You were always there. You never said to me, where have you been? What have you been doing? You never did those things for me. You preached the story of recovery. You preached the book to me, and you loved me. And you loved me every time. So that 12th summer was pretty traumatic. I mean, you know, here me, Mom, Peepaw was getting divorced. He was cheating on her with a best friend and built a house across the pond that she could see out of her kitchen window. Um, <laughs> Made my first C in, I made my first C in school that year, and I can still see the look of disappointment on my peepaw's face. 
here I got a daddy that looks like a woolly booger, and I, I, Lord, I don't want that to be part of me. So what do I do? I go and take a drink. My um, my best friend at the time uh, was a guy named Tim, and his daddy had a house down in Panama City. And uh, we took off, all of us and his daddy, and went down there to the to the beach. And uh, the daddy, Mr. Sentner, goes around and starts taking everybody's drink orders. And um, Tim had said something that sounded pretty good. I said, I think I'll take a six-pack of peach wine coolers. <laughs> Mr. Sentner goes to the store, comes back. I drank every last one of them, had my first blackout, passed out. That was my first conscious drink of alcohol. I wanted something to be different. And I knew from watching Mima and all them parties that when they partake of that stuff, it changed them. It made them giddy. It made them laugh. And I wanted it to do that for me. And it did. It made me forget everything. I slept like a baby for the first time that I can remember sleeping. Now, I've always said that was my first conscious drink of alcohol, but that wasn't my first taste of alcohol. You see, we had a granddaddy, big mama and granddaddy, and granddaddy made the best homemade scuffle of wine um, out of anybody I knew. And at Christmas and holidays... Uh, we got to have a glass of that homemade scuffle of wine. And I can remember being the only one that I would down mine and hand my glass back to Mama saying, can I please have some more? I loved the way it felt. So see, I knew what the alcohol could do for me. I knew it would help. And it did. It made me go to sleep. It made me get the committee to shut up up here, all the worrying and everything going on in my head, make it go away, and it did. So then I started, you know, I knew where Meemaw's liquor was, so I would go and pour out a Sprite bottle, and um, I would get in her 151, that's what I liked, 151 rum. And I would fill my Sprite bottle up with that rum. And we'd all be sitting there at the table talking and stuff, and I'm getting my drink on, and they think I'm having a Sprite. Now, I like to tell this story. Sometimes Mama will share about that she at one point knew that Mima had a problem with drinking. And so Mama was going through the cabinet marking all the alcohol bottles and the liquor bottles, trying to keep up with how much Mima was drinking. What she didn't know was I was going in there, so she thought Mima was drinking twice as much as she really was because I was taking the rest of it. Yeah. Um, alcohol was doing for me at the time what I wanted it to do. I didn't start out drinking every day. It was a weekend thing. I was in the band. We would drink after a football game, go to a field party, go out somewhere. Somebody always had some beer or some drink. Uh, it had always been my dream to go to the University of Alabama and play in the Million Dollar Band. I'm a huge Alabama fan. My, most of my family is. We got one Auburn cousin that we put up with. <laughs> we tolerate her. Um, her boy's from Alabama, by the way. Um, but anyway, so that had always been my dream. Um, the man that Mama was married to at the time, my senior year, uh, had a little money, and so I got to go to the University of Alabama. Loved it. Now, let me tell you something, though. I'm from a small town, and Delusia's not that big. Our band had a big band, and it was maybe 110, 125 members on a good weekend. Million Dollar Band has 450 people in it, y'all. We have our own plane when we go somewhere. I mean, the kind that's got 12 seats going all the way across, okay? It was huge. So you get all of us together, and it is a par T unlike any I had ever seen. Thursday night was our big practice before that Saturday. So after Thursday night practice, we'd all have a big green book party. Friday night was the night before the game. Of course, you got to have a party then. Saturday, we had a game whether we won or we lost. We was either celebrating or commiserating one or the other. <laughs> Sunday was pro football. I'm a huge Dallas Cowboy fan, and somebody always had a game on somewhere. Okay, so it became a pattern for me to drink on the weekends. Um, something happened to me at one of the band parties, and, um, you know, I, I had... Wanted to be different in high school, wanted to be different than the other girls. So one way I did that was I kept my virginity. At one of the band parties afterwards, I was raped. And see, that was traumatic for me because I was still a virgin. I was trying to save myself from marriage. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be different than my mama. I wanted to try to do things different. And when he did that to me, you know, that took away. That took that away from me. And I felt that was the last little piece of good I had in me. So the next morning, I couldn't tell you what had happened to me. I know today it was post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever. My roommate, I come in, and my roommate's like, you know, where in the world have you been? I don't even know. Um, I started falling in love conveniently and several and often, uh, trying to make right what had, had happened to me. You know, I, I wanted to make right. Thursday night. Game, uh, the Green Book Party, Friday night, night before the game, Saturday the game, Sunday's Pro Bowl, Monday, why not? Tuesday, mm, okay, maybe. Wednesday, the dance club start opening. See, I was a social drinker. I never drank by myself. I always had people around me, and I loved to dance. I danced all my life. So when the dance clubs would open, buddy, I'd be the first one in the door. 
I dropped out my first semester in Alabama. My mama said, you're coming home. And I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I think I'm going to stay up here. So I got an apartment and I got a job working at a restaurant that had a bar in it. How convenient was that? Uh, I think I paid the first month's rent in that apartment. I think that's the only time I ever had money to pay for that. Um, February 19th, 1991 uh, was a significant day in my life. See, I told you about I was raised with my family and my grandparents and my great-grandparents and my big mama, uh, my mother's grandmother, my Mima's mother. Loved me unconditionally. It didn't matter what kind of grades I made in school. It didn't matter what was going on in my life. Her house was over by the high school, and I would get out of school, and I'd go over to her house, and she'd have me a big old pan of baked macaroni and cheese with sausage in it with that welfare cheese, and I couldn't get enough of it. Um, she, she loved me no matter what. Prom dates, whatever, we were always at Big Mama's house. And so no matter what was going on with Mama, and then after everything happened with me, Mom, and Peepaw, you know, Big Mama became my new safe place. On February 19th, 1991, she died. And I remember thinking as I'm going down there to Andal- from Tuscaloosa to Andalusia for the funeral, I was like, you know what? Big Mama raised me up in church. I can remember laying on the wooden pew next to her and in church and hearing them singing them songs. They were Church of Christ, and she put that love in me. But I also heard when I was in there that if you thought it, you might as well have done it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to hell. Let me see how fast I can get there. The next three months of my life were a blur. I've had people tell me stories. I can't really tell you a whole lot about it. Um, I know that I, uh, as a, a friend in the room today likes to say, she's a recovering slut. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I did what I had to do to survive. Um, drinking was an everyday occurrence for me. I can say I never, there's a whole paragraph in the big book that talks about the things we did and the things we tried. And the, uh, I wouldn't wake up till around noon, but when I woke up, I had to have something. Now, that might be Listerine, that might be perfume, that might be whatever you have in your cabinet, because I don't know where I am sometimes, you know. Um, it might be alcohol, but I had to have something to get me by to get to where I could get what I needed. I tried switching from liquor. I did switch from liquor to beer. Um, I could drink many a man under the table drinking that liquor, but beer would hit me quicker. I could get drunk faster off of beer. Beer was also cheaper, so I became a Miller Lite long neck drinker. I would try taking just a certain amount of money to the club. Well, that wouldn't work because I might have enough money to buy one drink. Like, well, psh, what was the point in that? I need to tie one on. So you're sitting next to me and you're cute. You're going to be buying my drinks the rest of the night because I'm going to let you think you're going to get something. Sometimes you might, sometimes you might not. <laughs> I can remember standing there in a bar one night listening to a band play and I got a Miller Lite in this hand and a cigarette in this hand and I crap all in my pants. And I just stand there and I'm still rocking on. I remember waking up one night in a stairwell. I don't know if it was a dorm room or apartment or whatever, but it was cement steps. And whoever I was with, I think it was a guy, had put a trash can over there by me and and had tried to get my head over in the trash can. I was covered in puke, vomit, pee, poop, everything. Woke up that way. I remember one night coming out of a a, a bar and... um. I remember coming out, and then I remember my friend dragging me. I had laid down in the middle of McFarland Avenue wanting to take a nap in front of oncoming traffic. So, see, you, we all have these stories. I, I was the picture of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I was doing things that I had been raised not to do. I was doing all kind of things I had been raised not to do. I was not the picture of the perfect child my mama and my grandparents had raised me to be. It was awful. It was awful. Part of my disease is about money. You know, I'm, a, I'm the only child and the oldest grandchild and the oldest great-great-grandchild. So what does that mean? Spoil. I pretty much got what I wanted. Um, you know, uh, that was just the way it was. So it didn't really, I didn't really comprehend the fact that, you know, if you have a checkbook and if it has checks still in it, that there might not be money behind there to back it up. So some of my pattern would be, you know, when I would wake up or come to, um, I would feel guilty about what I had done the night before. So I might ask my friend, you know, let's go shopping. I might buy you a new living room suit or buy me a whole new wardrobe or whatever to make myself feel better. Well, then I would feel bad about spending the money that in my soul of soul I knew I really didn't have. And so then I would go tie one on. So I had all these big brown official looking documents pouring out of my mailbox that said federal government that I was really afraid to open. And then one morning, May 18th, 1991, there's this knock at my door. 
On May 18th, 1991, I woke up that morning and I called my best friend and I said, we're going to Tuscaloosa and we're going to see Amanda. Now, she was really glad to hear that because for three months she knew I had not heard anything from Amanda and she was really worried. So she would say to me quite often, what are you going to do about Amanda? What are you going to do about Amanda? And I would say, God is going to tell me what to do about Amanda. And on May 18th, God told me to go to Tuscaloosa. So my best friend and my next best friend, the three of us went to Tuscaloosa and and on the way to Tuscaloosa, uh, we were getting kind of close, and, and my best friend said, what are we going to do when we get there? And I said, God's going to tell me what to do when we get there. And I have to tell you, one of the things I've learned about recovery and about truly working this program is if I walk this walk, God will walk it with me. And there have been times on that walk when things have come out of my mouth. Sometimes when I'm speaking, things have come out of my mouth. And I will think, where did that come from? Who is that saying that? And for me, May 18th was a whole day like that. It was a whole day like that. We got to Tuscaloosa, and we got to where Amanda lived, and we got out of the car, and the first thing I saw was where the mailboxes were. There was mail all over the ground. I mean all over the ground. And we went over there, and I picked one up, and it had her name on it. All that mail was for her. So we got a garbage bag out of the car. My best friend said, aren't we going to go check on her? I said, we're going to get all this mail up right now. So we got all the mail up, we put it in that garbage bag, we put it in the car. Then we went and knocked on the door and nobody answered. So I told uh, my best friend, I said, we need to go find the landlord and get him to let us in. Uh, and so the next best friend said, well, I'll stay here while y'all go. And I said, okay. And we, we were walking down the, the pathway to go find the landlord. And Amanda opened up the door. And so uh, I heard, Angie, she's here. And I said, okay. So we turned around and we walked back, we walked into the apartment. And we sat down and I said, Amanda, I said, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm here to make you an offer. And the offer is for this day only. If you want help, I'm going to get you help. Whatever you need, whatever it costs, wherever I've got to go, whatever I've got to do, I will get it for you for today only. If you don't want help, that's okay too. We'll go have lunch. We'll enjoy spending the afternoon together. We'll have a great time and then I'm going to go back home. The choice is up to you. And I said, I'm going to give you two hours to make up your mind. And I looked at my best friend and I said, come on, let's go. She said, we're going to leave. And I said, we're going to give her two hours. And so we did. And the other friend stayed there with Amanda. And we went to the mall at Tuscaloosa, my best friend and I. And we walked up and down that mall for two hours. And I mean, we were just sobbing, just crying. Because I knew she was not going to accept my offer. And I knew I was going to have to leave her there. And so that two hours for me was praying to God to give me the courage and the strength to leave her there. We got back to the apartment, and she accepted the offer. And I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) What do I do now? I knew a therapist in Fairhope, Alabama, and I called her on the phone. This was on a Saturday, and she happened, and she answered the phone. And I told her what was going on. She said, well, what's going on with Amanda? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, she's told me she's written a few bad checks. So my, my... You know, the lady that I knew said, well, maybe she's got a mental illness and we can get her in the hospital and we can get her some medicine and she'll be okay. And I said, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Okay. So she said, well, give me your number. So I did. She said, I'll call you back. And I said, okay. So she called me back a little while and she said, and we're in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is way up north Alabama. She said, you, and this is afternoon now, she said, you need to have her at Providence Hospital in Mobile, Alabama, which is way down the other end of Alabama at 9 o'clock in the morning and she's going to be admitted on the psychiatric unit. I said, we'll be there. She said, okay. She, oh, I, had to give her some, I had to give her a little insurance information that first time we called, you know. So I said, okay. So I hung up the phone and I said, we're going to go rent a U-Haul it and we're going to pack up all your stuff. And we're going to, we're going to Mobile, Alabama. We're going to have you there at 9 o'clock in the morning. I said, Amanda, we're going to pack up your things. You're going to buy your job. You're going to tell them that you're leaving and that's what we're going to do. She said, okay. So we went and rented a U-Haul it. We packed up all her stuff. And my friend happened to work in the substance abuse field. And she came over to me at one point and she said, well, Angie, I can relieve your mind about one thing. And I said, what? She said, Amanda's not drinking or drugging. I said, she's not. She said, no, I've checked everything in this apartment, and there is not a thing here. I said, well, okay. You know, I never entered my mind. I'm thinking she's got a mental illness. We're going to get her a few pills, and we're going to help her, and she's going to be fine, you know? <laughs> so we load everything up. We go to Andalusia, where my best friend lived, and we leave all the stuff there. And we, we got there probably about... About 4 o'clock in the morning when we finally got there, we slept in a couple hours, and Amanda and I take off to, to Mobile, Alabama, to put her in the hospital at Providence Hospital. 
And I have to say that, 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 so we put her in the hospital at Providence Hospital. She stayed there two months. She stayed one month on the psychiatric unit. Then she stayed the second month on the substance abuse unit. This was one of the few hospitals that had both in one place. And I, and I need to say this, that unit is not there anymore. It's gone. But it was there when I needed it to be there. It was there when I needed it to be there. And I, and I will share this too about the grace of God in my life. You know, several months went by, and I'm, Amanda wrote bad checks. I'm real responsible with money. Several months went by, and I, and I just thought one day, I thought, I never got a bill from that hospital. I never had gotten a bill. So I called them. And I said, hey, my daughter was in your hospital for two months. I know I need to be getting a bill. So this lady said, well, I'll check, you know, and she was gone and she was gone and she was gone and she was gone. And she came back on the line and she said, well, ma'am, that bill is paid in full. And I said, what? She said, it's paid in full. See, that one of them characters I married, he had insurance on Amanda. And it paid for every candy bar she ate, for every ice cream cone she had. Does my God have a sense of humor or what, you know? And I said, well, can you tell me how much it was? $58,000. Now, I will tell you, I was willing to pay every penny of that. I would have paid it. I would probably have still been paying it today. But I would have paid it. For that day only, I would have paid it. And I believe God knew my heart. And like I said, I got a funny God. And he took care of it for me. I want to say real quick, while I was in that treatment center, I was able to work on the rape. And, you know, it tells us that um, sometimes we have to seek outside help for outside issues. Um, so I'm in there in treatment, and um, my doctor's talking to me, and I made the mistake of telling him one day that I might have drank a little bit. <laughs> little did I know that this psychiatrist was a recovering alcoholic. So he started sending my young butt with y'all old farts over there at them old AA meetings. <laughs> that I mentioned I was 19 when I went to treatment. Um, so y'all were a bunch of old farts. And um, Alano Club down there in Mobile over there off of uh, Airport Road. And I remember going in and sitting in the back of the room, and I had long hair, and I would h- hide my face in it. I had one little eye peeking out so I could see where I was going, but I was hiding behind all that hair. And I'd sit in the very back, and I'd curl all up, you know, not wanting you to shake my hand, not wanting you to hug me, not wanting you to tell me keep coming back, or whatever it was you was trying to say. I wanted no part of you. I was angry. I was pissed. I was done. Um, You know, and I can remember as Mama's taking me down there to the treatment center, I'm pulling off my fake fingernails, and I'm telling her I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go back to that restaurant at the landing, and I'm going to get my job back, and uh, not thinking about all the gross stuff I had done, not thinking about all the sleeping around I had done, not thinking about the only thing in my refrigerator was cherry Kool-Aid and a tube of raw cookie dough because that's all I could keep down, not thinking about all of that. So I told him I might have drank a little bit, and he sent me to the meetings. And one day we went to a speaker meeting, and it was a Saturday afternoon, and a, a lady got up there at the podium, and she told my story. And I remember thinking, God, she, she's done everything like I have, and everything's happened to her like it happened to me. And But she's sober, and how, how is she able to get up there and smile and talk about all that? How did she get sober? So when I heard that that day and, and heard her say she was an alcoholic, that's when things clicked for me. Okay, if she got up there and everything about her was like me, and she's an alcoholic, well, that means I'm an alcoholic. Okay, well, what does that mean for me? Because I don't want to go back to that lie. You know, I was a chicken. I was too scared to kill myself. Uh, but I was taking the slow out by drinking myself to death. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to live that life. I was done with it. But she said, there's hope. How can I do that? So I started listening differently in meetings. And they gave us a big book. Um, and I started reading the big book and, and really trying to identify and listening to similarities in the rooms and in the speaker meetings that I was going to. Um, and it changed my life. When I came out of treatment, after the two months, I didn't know where I was going to go. You see why the, when I got in there, Mama and her friends had got all them brown official looking documents in two paper sacks and had took it all home and, and we have a family friend that's a lawyer. And I was looking at 15 years in Julia Towala Prison, which is the women's prisons right now, and we Tumpkin North of Montgomery. And that was with good time. I had written several checks over $200 in Tuscaloosa County, which made them felonies. Uh, if you're going to write a bad check, don't do it in Tuscaloosa County, Alabama. Do it somewhere else. Uh, it's just, it's too much trouble. So we get, I leave, and we get in the car. 
And Mama pulls out this official-looking document. I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, what is this? And she explains to me that um, she has went and paid all that money. She went to every single retailer that I had written a bad check, and she had paid all that money. But what this contract said was I had 10 years to pay her back or else I would serve the remaining time. And I signed that contract, and in eight years I had that money paid. Thank you, God, I did not have to go. I don't know that I would have survived. Um, the first year of sobriety was not easy for me or for my mama. I came back to live with her in her apartment in Dothan, Alabama. And there were many times we would sit on the couch. I'd be on the couch, and she'd be in her favorite blue recliner, us just bawling our eyes out, trying to talk to each other, just trying to have a conversation, trying to repair all the hurt and everything that had been done the years before. The first year wasn't easy. I don't know how many jobs I had. Uh, I remember losing a job because someone broke my anonymity. Um, someone had went and told the boss that they had seen me in an AA meeting, so I got fired. But if he told you that meant he was there and he got to keep his job, I never understood that. <laughs> anyway, so I take that anonymity statement um, seriously. I can remember walking in Level Plains Clubhouse the very first night like it was yesterday. And I can still see all my old timers sitting right there and and there's little Miss Peggy S and there's a blank spot and there's Gloria and old timers sitting around here and um Miss Peggy patted that seat and she said, Here, darling, you come sit by me. And to my right was Gloria, that was my sponsor, and to my left was Miss Peggy, she was my grand sponsor. And those people raised me up in AA. And you can say their suggestions if you want to, but then people told me what to do, and if they'd have told me to stand on my head, I'd have done it. I was willing to go any any lengths. That's what my sponsor told me. She said, use the same willingness and energy that you used to get your alcohol when you bring it in here. Use that same energy to get sober with. And I did. I made more than 90 meetings in 90 days. They told me to read the big book. I read the big book. She told me to be somewhere at a certain time. I was there. I was taught to be there at least 15, 30 minutes early. Uh, Mr. Bill would call me, um, kind of crotchety, and I just loved him. And he, we, he came in the car called The Boat. And he would say, all right, you be ready in 15 minutes. Yes, sir. I'd hang up the phone. I was ready in 15 minutes. And I got in that car, and I never knew where I was going. We might go to meeting in Dothan. We might go to meeting Enterprise. It might be Level Plains. It might be an area assembly. It might be a roundup. Um, all of us would go. I was raised up in this. Uh, I was raised up in that book, um, Candlelight Meetings. All of it. All of it. It saved my life. I didn't want to die. I didn't want to die. Here's how they told it to me. If I was told I had cancer... And that I was going to die. But if I take this little blue pill, and they told me that this little blue pill would cure my cancer, would I take that little blue pill? First one in line. So here's what I know today. I'm an alcoholic. I have the disease of alcoholism. And this is my little blue pill. And I take it every day. And for me, it doesn't matter if I have one year sober or coming up on a 20-year anniversary. I still have to do the things that I'm taught to do. I still have to go to meetings. I read my big book. I call my sponsor. I work the steps, and I work with other suffering alcoholics. And I know in my life today that suffering alcoholic doesn't necessarily mean the bum under the bridge. Sometimes I come into the room, and I'm suffering, and I need your help. I'm going to share one thing in close, and then Amanda's going to close. When Amanda was in that treatment center, uh, for two weeks, she couldn't have any visitors. And then after that, I went every week, every weekend to see her. And every weekend I went, it was another just terrible time. The first time I went, she hated me for everything I had done from conceiving her to everything in her life since that time. A few times later when I went, she told me about being raped. And I will tell you as a, as a parent, I don't, I don't know anything more devastating that your daughter can tell you than that. Or your son either can tell you. The next week I went and she told me she was alcoholic. For me, that was worse than the week before. You see, I had run from the disease of alcoholism all my life. I had run from it. I had done everything I could to get away from it, but I could not run from my daughter. So I ran to Al-Anon. And I've been a very active member of my group for the last 20 years, and I will continue to be an active member of my group because, you see, we have two precious grandchildren now, and I don't know what their histories are, but I can tell you they're going to have a Grammy that goes to Al-Anon. <laughs> I'd like, to, I'd like to close by saying this, and then Amanda's going to close. I would really like to thank Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, I have my ancestry lineage, too. 
And the first woman in my lineage, all she had was the big book. And all she had was the AA 12 and 12. And that's what she used. And the first woman she sponsored, that's how she sponsored her. And I thank God that as that lineage has continued down to me, that's what I was raised in too. Now we have Al-Anon literature and I use it and I embrace it and I love it and I, that was used for me too when I worked the steps and when I worked this program. But the big book was used with me too. And I was told that the promises on pages 83 and 84 were for me. And I have seen them come true in my life. And I had to do the third step prayer and I will tell you this, that was the hardest thing I've had to do in recovery. Because you see, I didn't, I didn't think God even knew who I was anymore. And the first time I had to say it out loud, all I could say was, God, because I didn't want him to hear me, because I thought if he knew me, he would kill me. This program has given me everything. So thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you, al for giving me a life, for giving my family a life. Thank you. One of the downsides of us doing this is that we really don't get to... Um, share all the miracles that have happened in our life as being in recovery. You know, one of the first ones is that she and I can ride in a car for four hours together to come to a roundup. <laughs> That's recovery right there. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we had to drive nine hours one way to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That was good, too. You know, that's what this program has given me. Um, all the promises have come true in our life today. You know, I am so thankful um, for my earth husband that I know my big mama prayed into my life. Uh, he is an absolutely wonderful man. We have two precious children. I have an eight-year-old daughter and a six-year-old boy that are absolutely the lights of my life. And I love the fact that my mama spoils them just the way me, mom, and big mama spoiled me. You know, anything they want, they ask Grammy for, and I love it. Um, <laughs> so many miracles have come out of being sober and hopefully you've been able to see some of the hope but also how God has gone before how God has gone before you see if it wasn't for mama getting that urge from God to come and get me that day on May 18th I don't think I'd be before you today if it wasn't for her marrying that last man I wouldn't be able to go to treatment center he's not in our life today thank God for that treatment center it's closed it's closed, and that psychiatrist has gone on to the big meeting in the sky. The people in these rooms that have been such an important part of my life, they're moving on. One of the one of the things I learned, um, you know, I remember doing my, I'm going to share this real quick. I remember doing my fourth and fifth step with my first sponsor in the back porch of that clubhouse. And after doing that step with Gloria, she said, what are you going to do if I decide tomorrow to go and get drunk? And I remember being overwhelmed and deer in the headlight, like, what in the world are you talking about? And she said, what are you going to do if I decide to go out tomorrow and get drunk? And I said, well, Gloria, I don't know. Why, why are you asking me this? She said, you go and you get another sponsor. Three and a half years later, she had gone back out. And she's still out there today. So I did what she told me to do. I got another sponsor. Because you see, this program keeps working. Three and a half years into sobriety, another miracle happened in my life. You see, I had an urge to still have that connection with my father. And I went to that hill in Tennessee, and he and I were out there walking around, and, and I ended up telling him my story. Ended up telling him my story. And he wouldn't mind me sharing with you today that as a result of that, he's 16 and a half years sober. He's a part of our life. Him and Mama are friends, and the first baby he ever held in his life was my daughter. Was my daughter. And they call him Pappy Slim, and we go to Tampa, and he takes us out on boat rides and shoot fireworks, and we have a big old time. The last three years, the last two years, my mom and I shared taking care of my Mima, my Mima, her mother. She was dying of COPD and emphysema. And so mom and I shared her, and she would spend two weeks at mama's house, and she would spend two weeks in my house, and I wouldn't give up that time for anything in the world. You see, if I wasn't sober, I couldn't have done that. When Mama first had me, her saddle block had gone wrong, and she couldn't hold me or care for me the first two weeks of my life. My Meemaw did. My Meemaw wiped my butt and fed me and changed my diaper and bathed me. And for the last couple of months of her life, we wiped her butt. We fed her. We took care of her and wiped her tears and did everything she had done for me. And I'm so thankful to this program for allowing me to do that for her. So many miracles. Um... 
Larry was talking last night about changes and, and him having to um, get used to somebody new with him on the road. And uh, he made a comment about a big book and opening up and it creaking. Um, as, as an aside, several of us have shared this weekend about what an awful week we've had. I don't know about you, but I had a bad week. Um, and several of us had. And I know for me today, my sponsor points out that mm-mm, something good's going to be happening in that roundup. Because <laughs> look at how the enemy is trying to attack, you know. And I don't know about y'all, but it's only Saturday morning. And I'm so full, I, I don't even know where to start. Well, one of the bad things that happened this week was the, the little, I have a third edition paperback that I had in treatment. And I carry that book everywhere I go. And, you know, a lot of old ladies put everything in their Bible. Well, I put everything in my big book. And it's got autographs from Tama and Clancy and Father Martin and, and pictures of me and, and all the old timers and notes that people say. And it's, it's like my Bible. Well, this week it broke. It broke. My little third edition paperback. And I looked at it, you know, and Lord, the pages are yellow and they're falling out and it's just falling apart. So I'm having to use a new big book. So I'm having to get used to something new. It's creaked when I open it. But you know what? Me and this big book right here are going to have some adventures. Now, I'm looking for a third edition paperback big book, but <laughs> me and this book right here are going to have some new adventures. And I've already heard stuff this weekend that I'm already putting in here. I always like to close with this. That old-timer, Mr. Bill, that old codger that used to take me everywhere, he died with 28 years sobriety. And everybody didn't like him, but I loved him. And he was a big book thumper. And he gave me his second edition big book. And he highlighted this paragraph in that book, and he wrote, If you will abide by this, you will know true happiness. And today I understand that, and, and today I share this, and all 12 steps are in this one paragraph. It's the last paragraph on page 164. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to Him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.